Hello, hello everyone and welcome. We're gonna give it about a minute or so more to let a few others join us and then we'll get the show on the road here. All right, and, and I'll, I'll continue to let people come in um, as they're in the waiting room, but just wanted to quickly thank everyone for joining us. Um, I know it's been a busy time for everyone. Um, things are going well on campus, and, and I'll let Chris Clooney get into that a little bit more, but just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Brandon McClady. I am with the Davidson Athletic Fund, along with my colleague, Angela Serkovnik on here. Um, again, we just wanted this opportunity to get in front of you guys to give an update on, on what's happened in this past year but also talk about a little bit what we want to do move forward and what we want to do um, to improve the program. And, and we thought no better way to have uh, John Pastel on the call and, and talk about kind of his experience at Davidson and, and how that's impacted him now that he's no longer here and, and has success in his own right. So with that being said, again, thank you everyone. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. And again, we ask you that you hold your questions till the end, until the Q&A session. So Axel will have some, some questions for John and then we'll have a Q&A at the end, but um, feel free to use the, the, the raise hand feature or you can use the chat box or just unmute yourself. Again, we want this to be interactive. So again, thank you everyone, welcome. And with that being said, I'll pass it over to Chris Clooney. Thanks, Brandon. Um, hey everybody, hope everybody's doing well. Um, appreciate you all, as Brandon said, jumping on board and spending some time with, with us. And we're excited, as, as you said, to have to have John on on here to, to share some of his experiences and um, good to see Axel and so many of you others, um, you know, alum and, and supporters of the program. Really appreciate you all taking the time. We were just talking about how things are sort of slowly crawling back to a new normal. Um, and that's sort of how we feel a sense of relief at Davidson. The fact that we had an in-person graduation a few weeks ago is pretty remarkable that we were able to pull that off, um, that we were able to pull the whole year off. Um, you know, you look at sort of August and September of last year, we just did not know what we didn't know. And everything was evolving and changing so drastically. And if you know coaches, if you know Drew and you know Derek, they love structure. If you know scholar athletes, and I see Yash is here on, on the call, they love structure. And it's like COVID gave us none of that. It's like, here's what we're doing right now. And that might change tomorrow. That might change in an hour. And so it really was crazy to think that, um, you know, we had fall sports that we all had to push to the spring. You know, we started some of our winter sports in November, but there, you know, we were running the numbers. There was a, a point in time where we had, I think we did over a hundred home events um, between November and May. Um, and that doesn't even include the canceled events, right? So the makeups, changes, et cetera. Um, we never had to worry about, you know, coverage for a tennis match going on. Um, but also a field hockey game going on at the same time, right? Like that just never happened. That never, we never had to deal with that. We never had to deal with football and a baseball game. Um, so it's pretty incredible just to think about 21 sports competing at the same time. Um, but we pulled it off and it really was remarkable. Credit to scholar athletes, credit to our students, and really credit to, to, to the institution and President Quillen and, and, and senior leadership um, for providing a framework. Testing was a big part of that, um, the ability to test and, capture cases and, and really quarantine and isolate. And that's what kept us here on campus. Um, and so our, our values stood strong, our mission stood strong. We did, we did things the right way and we're fortunate enough to um, have an in-person graduation and also fortunate enough not just to be able to compete, but to compete very well, right? Even amongst the challenging year. And I'll let Drew go into that a little bit more, but we were just excited to be able to have the opportunity and we made the most of it. So um, you can certainly be proud of, of your alma mater and, and Davidson College and, and how we approach things. I think we did it much better than many others. Um, and, and we didn't just sort of survive through this time period. We tried to thrive and still continue to do athletics the right way. And we're excited about, you know, coming back and, and, and sort of turning into that new normal in the fall um, and, and looking to do it all over again, even better. So thank you all for what you do. Um, and Brandon, I kick it back to you to get started. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, appreciate that update. And, and I also want to give an opportunity for for Drew to give us a few words and kind of share a recap of the season and, and then kind of plans for the off season. Thanks guys. Thanks for everybody being here. This is, it was pretty great to see all the faces. Um, you know, we just finished a season about three weeks ago. So the season went a lot longer. Um, believe it or not, we started in uh, early January and went all the way through. Everything uh, was going pretty smooth for the most part. We finished the season just uh, 
Uh, made it to the semifinals again of the conference tournament. Uh, won a good match in the first round. Lost to VCU, the fin- uh, eventual champions. They're very, very, very good team this year. Uh, they had beaten uh, the number 18 team in the country right before they came. So uh, they're well prepared and played really well against Ohio State, which was <laughs> a very tough uh, match for them since uh, Ohio State was top five in the country uh, at the beginning of the season. Um, we ended the season quite well. I, guys competed extremely well considering everything that we've gone through this season. Uh, we almost beat uh, uh, Charlotte right before the tournament. Uh, 4-3 we lost, third set last match on. Uh, you know, a team that had three ranked players uh, in their lineup. And so, you know, we really ended the season well. We, we for those who don't know, we were kind of hit with a lot of injuries throughout the season. I think uh, I was just doing the numbers. And uh, since February, we were without at least one starter for the whole season. Um, and we had at least five matches without two. And that that had a little bit to do with COVID, obviously, a couple of weeks in there for, for some of our guys, but also just un, unusual injuries for us. And so uh, that cost us a few uh, key matches that I think that if we were healthy, we definitely would have won. Um, obviously, before the season, we had to make adjustments because of COVID. I think we had to re, uh, reschedule eight matches that we had uh, from before. Two of those got canceled as the end of the season. So, you know, I give a ton of credit to our guys this season. Uh, being as resilient as they are, it was uh, a very challenging, um, just challenging just to get through it. Obviously, we try to make it as normal as possible with the workouts that we did and as much time individually as we could do for them. And I think that definitely paid off and will pay off next year uh, with everybody coming back. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, I think, John, you'll, you'll talk about what your experience was, but you know, what they went through this year was, there was nothing like uh, a normal season was. So I, I give them all the credit in the world. Um, you know, these guys played great at the end of the season and kept their, their wits about them. And, and, and again, competed their butts off and, and showed up well for Davidson. So really proud of that. And uh, I wish we would have had a normal season. I, I lament as a coach, you know, we've been very successful lately and, and, and wanted that for these guys, but they handled it so well. And, um, and, and bright things are ahead for us. Uh, we go recruiting again this summer. We have our net, uh, regular national uh, clay courts and hard courts along with a few other tournaments that we follow. Uh, we typically go to, uh, starting June 1st, we're allowed to go off campus again. So we, we'll go to a couple academies and different things like that. So uh, we have four new players coming in next year. Uh, we have a former number one player from Spain coming in. Uh, we have a kid from India, quote unquote, hopefully he's going to be okay. He was, uh, I think, as high as 230 in the world, juniors. Um, and two American kids, a kid from Florida and a kid from Los Angeles, both top 150 players. So, you know, even though we lose a substantial six seniors this year, largest class I've ever had, um, and, and, and going to be a big gap, I think, in personality, we do have some guys that hopefully can fill some of those holes. And um, and again, those six guys that we got coming back was, with uh, Sam and Brooks being our seniors, uh, I think are excited. Um, and then for those of you who saw, Max uh, played one for us this year and ended up being all-conference. And so, you know, great things ahead for us, a New Yorker. So uh, first team all-conference. So uh, that's, about, that's about where we're at right now. Brandon, back to you. Thanks, Coach. Um, again, this opportunity, I think, is unique and, and something we really want to expand on moving forward. But the opportunity to have two of our alums get on this call to talk about their experience with Axel and John, I, I just think this is an, a, a fun thing to do. And we hope to really expand on this. And, and we got some fun questions kind of lined up. But again, hold your questions for the end. We'll have enough time for Q&A. You can ask John or Axel questions directly. Um, but with that being said, I'll pass it over to our moderator, Axel. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to see all you guys. Uh, congratulations to Drew and the players for a great season. I know it must have been really tough, but it seems like uh, you made the best out of it. So congratulations to everyone. Congratulations on the class of 21, 2021 for graduating. Um, I see Alejandro is here. That's, that's trouble, coach. Keep an eye on him. <laughs> um, yeah, and then welcome alumni as well. It's great to, uh, great to connect with everyone here, I think. Yeah, and thank you, Brandon, and, and just the department as a whole for organizing these events. Um, I know I've really appreciated being able to connect and, and meet all these alumni. I'm actually, and I think Jeff Lyle is on the call here. We are, uh, I'm meeting up with him on Friday. We're going to go hit some balls. Um, I'm out in San Diego for vacation this week. So 
Um, yeah. And I mean, I wouldn't have met him if we, I think it was through one of these events a couple of years ago. Uh, but all right. So just to introduce myself, my name is Axel Fries, class of 2020, graduated last year. Um, yeah. At first, when, when coach called me uh, to ask if I wanted to be, you know, a speaker on this call, I thought about time. They want to, they want to learn, learn more and uh, hear from my, my wisdom. Uh, turns out they just needed a moderator. So <laughs> that's my job, but it's an honor nonetheless. Um, great to be here. We have John Pastel on the call, legend, um, one of the goats of Davidson Tennis. So it's great to have him here as well. Thanks uh, for being here. Yeah. So um, I'm going to start off by asking some questions to John. Um, we'll sort of just have a, have a conversation and then we'll open it up um, for the rest of you to, to ask us some questions, you know, ask questions to Coach Drew or, or to anyone else. Um, feel free then to either type them into the chat to me personally. Um, I know there's a raise hand feature as well, so you could do that as well. Um, and I'll do my best to uh, make sure we get to all the questions. But yeah, so let's start it off here. So John, if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how your, how your tennis journey started. Sure. Uh, th thanks for hosting this, Axel, and hello to all the uh, alums and uh, current team members out there. Um, really excited to do this. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Connecticut, uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut, um, which kind of sits right between halfway, really between Boston and New York and very rural town. You know, my public high school, probably 60 kids in the graduating class. Um, I didn't have that many people to play tennis with growing up. So I, I mostly played, played with my dad in the evenings uh, when he got home from work. Um, and during my high school years, I had a tennis coach who moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina, and started a tennis academy down there. And I would go down there from time to time uh, to visit and to train. And um, this guy named Robbie Smith and Tim Wilkinson, who some of you may know, uh, they started an academy in Charlotte, you know, I guess in the early 90s. And I used to go down there and train with them. And Robbie was friends with or knew of, of Jeff Frank. And he gave me the intro to, to, to Coach Frank uh, during my junior, senior year. And, um, you know, I, Davidson, at, at, that, at that point in my life, seemed like such a great fit for me because I wanted to play Division One tennis. I wanted to go to school down south. And Davidson was, you know, a small community. And I was used to living in a small community. So the thought of going to a big university was a scary thought for, you know, a, a kid growing up in a small town like uh, Old Lyme. So when I met... When I met Coach Frank and the athletic director at the time, Terry, Heil, uh, Terry Holland, um, I just really hit it off with Coach Frank. I, you know, did a, you know, spent the night with one of the seniors, and um, I just felt like Davidson was was a really good fit for me, and um, that's how I ended up at, uh, at Davidson. Was was tennis always your kind of your first love, or or when did you when did you feel like that's what you wanted to uh, to go all in? Yeah. Um, Good question, and, and and I you know viewed myself as, as as a tennis player from from a very early age. You know, it became my identity, as as I'm sure it did for for many of you on this call. Um, we used to go to this small town in Rhode Island every year uh, in the summer, and they had a great tennis program. And I was probably seven or eight years old at the time. And in order to make you know the traveling inter club team, you had to make it onto the ladder, right? It was a you know competitive thing, and it was a challenge. And um, I remember one summer that was my goal, right? To practice and practice and practice, hit on the hit on the backboard and um, challenge people to make that make that ladder, make the traveling team. And you know, I, I remember my parents had to drag me to the beach that summer because all I wanted to do was play tennis. And I felt like, you know, that summer when I was seven or eight, that's that's when I kind of got hooked on the sport and it kind of fell in love with it and, it and it became my identity shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So then once you got to Davidson and you got to campus as a freshman, what was kind of that experience like and how did you feel that you, you grew over those four years? Yeah. Um, I was very immature when I arrived uh, <laughs> in the, uh, the fall, the fall of 94. Um, I, I would say uh, in the beginning, it was tough for me. Um, I, I was really challenged academically. I went to a public high school that wasn't that great. Um, I was, you know, had poor study habits coming in and sort of, you know, just thought I could do the bare minimum and sneak by. So my freshman year was pretty rough. Uh, I, I didn't do a good job balancing academics with, with tennis. All I really wanted to do was play tennis and 
I learned the hard way that I had to commit a lot of hours every night to study because there's no easy route at Davidson. Um, so, so that was a bit of a humbling experience back then. And I remember the first year, you know, although I had success on, on, on the tennis court, I, I was struggling to, you know, maintain my grades and, uh, you know, just kind of deal with the, with the workload, which, you know, I, I sort of fought it for a while, but you don't last at Davidson unless you change. So, you know. yep. A lot of, a lot of late nights in, in the library. That's, yeah, for sure. <laughs> those are uh, some of my fondest, but also, uh, worst memories from yeah. <laughs> Davidson as well. So how did you, uh, and I know a lot of people go about this differently, but how, how were you able to, um, if you did eventually kind of balance those two with, with, uh, athletics and, and academics, um, did you have yeah. any sort of secret to that or that you could share? No, I, I, I didn't, I don't have any secrets that I can share. I, I think, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's kind of where Davidson prepared me for the world. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's time, time management, being disciplined, um, having, having a structure and, you know, if, if you don't, develop that structure or, or, or set it up in a way, um, you know, you're not going to be successful on the tennis court or in the classroom. And, um, you know, as I'm sure everybody did, you just, you just kind of figure it out. And, 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 and that's the discipline that you have coming out of a school like Davidson, uh, yep. you know, four years doing that, um, you learn something along the way. Mm -hmm. What did you, what did you major in? I was a political science major. When did, is that, did you know going in that that's what you uh, wanted to say? I had, I had no idea what I, <laughs> what I wanted to major in, you know, uh, a, a, a lot of folks, um, you know, at least a lot of my friends back in the day knew that they either wanted to go into law or medicine. That was, that was a common route. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I, I honestly probably picked uh, a random major just because I had to choose something. I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, when I got out of school. Um, if I could do it over again, I would, I would probably pick, you know, econ, I, I, I would pick a major that, um, I can apply to my job today. Um, the political science is not something that, that I can really apply to what I'm doing every day in my, in my current role. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Same with me. I had no idea. Um, I actually switched majors midway through. So I'd originally, uh, declared to be an econ major, but then I switched to be a math major, uh, my okay. junior year. Um, so yeah, say, I mean, same with me. I had no idea. And, yeah. you know, even three years in, I still wasn't sure. <laughs> right. Right. It's tough. Um, but you have to, you have to figure it out. But all right. Enough about school um, to get to some tennis. This is the fun part. So what was it like being a part of the tennis team? What, are, what were some of your, your fondest memories there? Yeah. I mean, we were, we were a really close group back in the day. Um, I still keep in touch with uh, a lot of the Davidson tennis team, uh, you know, from the mid nineties. Um, we obviously spent a lot of time on the court together. We spent a ton of time off the court together. We'd hang out on the weekends, we party together. Um, you know, one of my fondest memories is after every practice, we would, we would go to the commons, right? And we would sit there for hours. Um, you know, nobody wanted to leave because as soon as you left, you knew, you know, you'd be going to the library. So just hanging out with the guys and, um, you know, we all became very close, uh, over the years. And like I said, a lot of us are still in, are still in uh, close contact today. Mm -hmm. do you meet up with them at all still sure yeah i, I had lunch with one of them yesterday uh, all right. was, uh tyler f uh, was in the was in the city so you know we caught up over lunch um scott brace he lives in greenwich now uh so i still yeah. see a lot of the guys Fantastic. Is, awesome oh. awesome yeah so then um for for those that don't know john you were socon player of the year in 1996 and 1997 uh, you were the first ever Davidson player to reach the NCAA tournament in 97. Um, you were inducted into the Davidson Athletics Hall of Fame in 2009. Um, so you have all these accomplishments. Is there, do you have any favorite match or favorite memory as a, as a player on court um, that, that you sure. remember from, from your time at Davidson? Yeah, there, for sure. Uh, there are a couple, you know, key matches that, you know, really, really stand out. And I'd say the the, the first one was um, the Southern Conference Tournament my freshman year. Um, I was playing doubles with Holt Vaughn, who was a senior at the time. He was the captain. And um, back then, uh, the conference tournament was held every year at Davidson. And um, the tennis courts used to be in the center of campus. Uh, it used to be in a really cool spot. And 
the Southern Conference tournament was held over spring frolics weekend, right? So it was like the one time a year where you'd actually get fans to come out and watch, okay? And on, and on this particular day, it was the last day of the Southern Conference tournament. Holt and I were playing in the finals against this team from uh, ETSU. And um, everybody was out. Like, it was amazing. You looked up and there were just mobs of people watching tennis, right? Which never really happened. And um, it, was, it was a good team uh, who we had lost to before. And I remember Holt and I lost, lost the first set. We came back and we won a tight second set. And one of Holt's buddies um, was a member of KA, which that, that house was close by. He went over to the fraternity house and he started cranking Holt's favorite pump up song, which was I of a Tiger. Okay. Yeah. So the so the music's going and Holt is getting ready to, you know, to to start serving in the third set. And you know, the crowd's going about as crazy as they go for a tennis match, but uh, it looked pretty wild back then. And, you know, Holt was just so excited, so, so pumped up. All of his friends were out there watching that he cranks his first serve and it hits me in the back of the head, right? <laughs> and it's just like totally killed the moment, right? The energy went from like level 10 to level five. And uh, we ended up losing like 6-2. It wasn't that close <laughs> of a serve. So it was, it was pretty disappointing. But, um, you know, that, that it, was, it was definitely a memorable match. Um, wow. <laughs> And, I, and, you know, fast forward a few years, um, one, of, what, one of my favorite matches that really stands out, and it was probably my, it was definitely my best win in college. Uh, my senior year, we went to the Blue Gray Invitational, um, which was a prestigious tournament. They had a lot of the you know, top teams in the country who played. And um, the last day we were playing against uh, Tulane. And Tulane at the time, uh, the number one player for Tulane was ranked number two in the country. And this was a big match for me. It was like halfway through the spring season. And I knew if I wanted to make the NCAA tournament, um, I kind of had to win this match, right. To really get my ranking up there. And I was on a good streak playing really well. And during this tournament, as soon as the match was clinched, they would pull everybody off. Right. So as soon as somebody got four points, mm -hmm. didn't matter where you were in your match, they would just, they would just pull your match. So before the match, a couple of guys in the team were like, JP, we, we're going to try to stall. OK, you know, even if we're losing, we're going to take bathroom, bathroom breaks. We're going to make sure to stay on the court for as long as possible so you can get your match in. OK. And I remember the day well, it was like a cold, windy day. The conditions weren't great. We were down in Alabama at this tournament and um, we lose a doubles point. Right. And then a few guys start losing. And like we're, we're quickly down like 3-0. Maybe we, we won one. I think maybe Scott Briggs won. I, he's, he's on the call. He's going to know. So it may have been 3-1. And I remember Brett Alachi was playing number two at the time, okay, was losing. And, like, he kept checking in on my score. He's like, JP, what's the score? What's the score? And he is taking so much time in between points. He's taking bathroom breaks. I mean, he's, you know, probably taking two to three minutes in between points, trying to stall as much as possible because he really, you know, cared for me. He knew how important this match was for me. And um, I remember I beat the guy three and three. And, like, it was one of the best matches I, I, I ever played. And, um the fact that I beat him in, in straight sets was just, it was, a, it was just an amazing feeling. And I knew after I beat him that, you know, my chances of going to the NCAAs were, you know, close to, close to hundred percent. So that was, that was a really cool moment for me. So how, how, uh, I guess, how close were, were, was the number two player then to losing? Like how much <laughs> were you stressed was, at all there? Probably within the next two minutes, Brett was done. <laughs> but since I won, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, that's yeah. awesome. That's fantastic. I have, uh, I have similar stories, but the other way around where uh, our opponents would stall. Um, Bethune, Bethune Cookman is a team we, we played, I think, every year. Um, okay. And if it was my freshman year or maybe sophomore year. Um, they, yeah, their, their roster was quite weak at the time. Um, most of our players were winning pretty easily you know we were most of them were up 6-0 3-0 that kind of thing I look over um Shamile who's playing one at the time hits a serve wins the point sprints picks up a ball hits the next serve wins the point wins that game sprints to the other side and just yeah. starts bouncing not even waiting for his opponent um my opponent then fakes an injury <laughs> another one of their players fakes an injury on another court the two players faking an injury and then me and then Tommy Mason, I think we were kind of battling out to see 
um, who could finish first. And because his player, his player's injury took a little longer than mine, yeah, I, was yeah. to, uh, <laughs> I was able to win my match before him. Um, nice. So that's fun. Do you have any, do you have a least favorite match or a least favorite team that you played? I mean, the least, the least favorite team for me to play was East Tennessee State. Um, okay. I felt like they always had a player there that would get under your skin. And, you know, I remember one player in, in, in particular, um, and the guys who were my year uh, will we'll, we'll definitely remember this guy's name was Damian Chiachi. Okay. And I guess the guy referred to himself as Mini was his nickname. Mm-hmm. And I was playing, and he was, he was a good player. He was, he was from South America. And every time this guy would want a point, he would just like look at you in the face and pump his fist. And he was like, come on, Ninny, come on, Ninny, come on, Ninny. <laughs> Drive me absolutely crazy. And then I started doing it back to him. And then it yes. just, the, thing, it, the match turned into a disaster. But um, I just remember ETSU would always find a way to get under my skin. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's a, that's a conference match too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Back okay. down there, they were in the Southern Conference. A good team always, but uh, yeah. they, had a, they had a few annoying guys. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Coach, we got to get the, uh, the A-10 tournament to, to be at Davidson so we can have <laughs> during Frolics weekend. That's the, yeah. that's the, ta- if, if anything, <laughs> that's, the, that's the takeaway here. That's it. That's where you get the fans. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, fantastic. But all right. So let's move on to uh, some more career focused questions. Um, so after after your time at Davidson, you went to plan the tour for a little bit. Um, yep. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience on tour and, and sort of what, you know, what made you realize that that was what you wanted to do? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, the, the summer between my sophomore and junior year, um, you know, it's, it's, some people in college, right, they, they, they play tennis and they kind of lose interest. And over the four years, you know, by the time they, they graduate, they're, they're glad to be done. I, I sort of had the opposite path where. I, I kept getting better in college and I kept working harder and harder. So between my sophomore and junior year, there was a, uh, a summer tournament up here in Connecticut that was a pre-qualifier for the pilot pen, which if you don't know what that is, that was a, um, a pro tournament right before the U S open where they get a lot of top players who, who were playing it. So this, this pre-qualifier, the winner would get a wild card into the qualifying of that event. So that summer I won that tournament. I beat Thomas Blake, James Blake's older brother in the final and I got a wild card into this, into this pilot pen, which is like a big deal at the time. Um, it's held at Yale University. And um, I, I remember when I, it, was, it was like my, my first exposure to, to, to pro tennis. And it was a really cool experience where if you were a player, even in the qualifying, you know, you'd have a security guard that would put you on the back of a golf cart and like take you to your match and go through the fans. And you're out on the court, you'd have all the line judges, the ball boys. And I remember thinking, God, this is a, this is a really really cool experience. Like this is this is what I want to do. And um, actually, won my first round, uh, and then in the second round, I lost to a, a guy named Jeff Grant, who played at Duke a few years before. He was about five years older or, or something. He was probably like 150, 200 in the world at the time. Mm. And I played him pretty close. And um, I just remember thinking after that experience, just how cool it was hanging out in the players' lounge and just being around that whole scene and. You know, I, I, I just remember that moment thinking to myself, wow, I keep working hard. Like, this is something that I really want to try to do after school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up doing it. Yeah, awesome. Do you think, because um, I know for me at least, um, I grew up in Sweden, uh, played juniors there. There is a lot of mixed opinions about for the top players, if they should go to college or if they should yeah. go pro right away. Do you think that um, going to college helped you in that sense? Or do you think, looking back, if you would have had gone pro right away, do you think there would have been kind of different results there? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was, I was in no position at all to uh, even think okay. about, you know, playing, playing pro coming out of high school. I mean, I was, you know, probably around 40 in the country coming out of junior. So, not, I mean, not even close to going down that route. Um, I do think it's unusual for an American to spend four years in college and then make it on the tour after, right? I mean, a lot of people try it. It's just those years between, you know, 18 and, and, and 22 are just such key developmental years um, if you want to be a pro, right? And I feel like during, during that time frame, 
there's obviously a lot of other things you're doing in college, right? But those who decide to go on the pro tour during those years, you know, their game is just getting pushed every day, every week by, by real pros, not college players. So, you know, if you have the talent and you're, you know, at that level, your, 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 your game just really elevates way more than it would if you stayed in college for four years. Right. Um, I mean, there aren't that many examples of somebody staying in college for four years and really making it on tour, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a question that, that we debated a lot in Sweden, at least, and that they still yeah. talk about um, is if they should, well, if, if the top Swedish players should decide to go to college or not, or if they should, you know, go on tour right away. Um, yeah. So it's just interesting to, to, to talk about. So, yeah. So, okay. So then uh, you played pro for two years. Is that right? It gets about three years all in a little on and off at times, but yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And then, and now you, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so you currently serve as the head of U S hedge fund sales at Alliance Bernstein. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. All right. Yeah. So uh, how did you, how did you end up there? And, and if, tell us a little bit more about, about your role. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I stopped playing tennis and um, probably in about you know, 2002, uh, yeah, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, you know, tennis was all I, I, I really knew. Um, I knew I didn't really want to teach full time. Um, I started doing a little bit just to make some money during that transition. Uh, just through a contact, I got connected into the commercial real estate world and, um, I didn't, didn't like my job. Uh, and I, I stuck it out for a couple of years, but I, I knew it wasn't really well suited for me. And in heavy, you know, May of 06 or something, a, a friend of mine who I you know, played on tour with asked me to play in a, um, a pro-am charity event in, um, in Greenwich where I, where I live now. And I remember I didn't want to do it. I was sort of like, I played in so many of these things. I just, I just don't feel like it. So he kind of twisted my arm and said, it'll be fun. Come along. So I went and I was out on the court, uh, playing in this pro-am and I was not having much fun. I was pretty disinterested and I get off the court and this guy approaches me and he says, Oh, you're a good player. Like, where did you, where did you play? And I said, Oh yeah, this is what I've done. I, I went to Davidson college and he goes, well, did you know a guy named Jim Vincent? He, he played tennis at Davidson college. I, I didn't know Jim. Jim is about six years older than me. He goes, yeah, Jim, he played tennis at Davidson. He had actually transferred to Vanderbilt after two years, but uh, he did play tennis at Davidson. And because Jim is, you know, has been my best hire on the sales force ever. Right. And Jim went to Davidson, played tennis there and was doing commercial real estate before he got to Alliance Bernstein. So my resume just happened to match up like perfectly with this guy's best salesman. So, um, at the time, Bernstein was hiring, business was doing really well, and uh, they hire a little differently than most firms. They try to find people outside of the industry that they can train their own way. So he gave me his business card, and he was like, you know, if you're interested in, in talking to me, um, you know, you give me a shout. So I had no idea what equity research sales was at the time. I mean, I was kind of interested in markets and stocks just because my dad used to trade his own portfolio. Um, but I literally got on the phone with you know, everybody I, I knew who touched finance to figure out what this job was. And um, when I interviewed and, um, you know, that, that reminds me, what I, I went in many times to interview, but what really I think got me the job, and I'll never know for sure, is Jim Vincent called Coach Frank, right, to, 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 to really get the scoop on me. And I don't know exactly what Coach Frank said, because I obviously wasn't on that call. Whatever Coach Frank said, I mean, he provides such overwhelming support on my behalf that I, I really believe that he kind of sealed the deal, um, which, was, which was amazing. And, you know, Coach, Coach really cared about, about his players while we were at school and even, and even after school. And, you know, I'll, I'll always remember him really, really going to bat for me and, like, putting, you know, putting, putting his word on the line and, and, and telling Jim, who would obviously told the higher-ups at Bernstein that he needed to hire John, is, tennis coach who nobody knows him better, you know, really vouched for his character and his work ethic, you know, all the qualities that, that, that we're looking for. So, um, you know, I owe a lot of gratitude to, to, to coach for, for doing that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely an interesting route. Um, and I think what's, 
what's important there is just the fact that you didn't know uh, what you wanted to do. Um, this just kind of came up kind of out of nowhere. I mean, you, not I mean, necessarily that you were lucky, but it, Axel, it did come out of nowhere. I got, I got lucky, you know, I met the, I met the right person at the right time. I was kind of wandering. I didn't really have much direction. I was unhappy in my current job in the commercial real estate industry. Didn't know how to, you know, get into the finance world. And, um, it was, it was pure luck and, and, and chance that, that I happened to, you know, go to that event, meet that guy and, you know, match up exactly with Jim Vincent and, and, and his resume. And, uh, you know, fortunately was given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But then you, you know, then you went for it as soon as uh, you were presented with that opportunity, like you said, yeah. I mean, you, you called up people in the industry. Um, you did all of these interviews, you talked to your coach, all of that. Um, so really, you know, I don't know if it was necessarily taking a risk there, but actually going for it and, and taking that chance at least um, to see if this sure. is something that could work out. Um, yeah. so, so now that you've been there for, I guess, now 15 years, if it was 2006. Um, I left a period of time, but you know, I've, I've been with AB for, yeah, I guess, 10, 11 years. What, I was, back. Okay. So what is it that has uh, kept you in the finance yeah. uh, industry this long? Yeah, uh, a good question. I mean, a lot of things, really. Um, you know, what has kept me at AB? Why did I? Why did I go back? Uh, give you give you guys a very brief history, and you know, I don't want to take too much time here. But I, I joined Bernstein in in two thousand six, and I'm basically selling research stock ideas to hedge funds uh, at a very simple level. One of my clients at the time hired me in twenty twelve, so I actually switched sides. I went from the sell side to the buy side. And I, I worked at a hedge fund for about three and a half years. And in 2015, I, I came back to Bernstein. And the big reason why I came back to Bernstein was because it was it, it, it's such a great culture, has has such great people who work there. And I had horrible culture at um, at the hedge fund that, that I that I work for. And I guess you don't realize how important culture is until you until you don't have it. So um, you know, just for those who are you know, on, on the tennis team now looking, looking for, for careers post, post college. Um, don't lose sight of that. Like make sure wherever you work, you actually like the people You feel like they're going to support you. And it's, it's, it, it's a good environment where people are working together and supporting each other because if you don't have it, it becomes toxic very quickly. Mm -hmm. so 100, so 100%. Yes. Yeah, so that's what got me go, to, to go back to, to AB, but you know, I really like markets. I mean, Part of my job is, is figuring out, you know, what stocks are going to work, right? And trying to help clients make money in the market. And we have a group of analysts who are all, you know, industry experts in their respective industries. So I have a, you know, a great group of people who I can really lean on for insight and, and, and perspective. But trying to figure out the markets every day is just a challenge, right? It's problem solving, uh, you know. You want to compare it to tennis it, you know it's, it's dynamic right it, every day is a little different every match is a little different and it's it, i find it to be a real challenge it's intellectually stimulating and it really is all about you know problem solving risk reward uh all, all that stuff um so for, for me i i get excited waking up every morning learning from my analysts speaking with really smart clients um trying to research the next great idea uh so awesome so um Bitcoin, yeah, yes or no? Invest or? I hate Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have, you know, friends in the industry, outside of the industry, or you know, just giving me massive FOMO for not owning any. So um, I finally bought some, you know, way higher than it is now, uh, but yeah, very it's little dropping. And and I just did that so I wouldn't have FOMO in case it went to a hundred thousand, but. I don't know. Bitcoin is one of these things where I've tried to understand it over and over again. I still can't really explain it to my kids. And I would just rather own companies that I understand. I understand how they make money. I understand the cash flow that, 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 that they generate. Um, no one can explain to me why, why Bitcoin should be worth 60000 and not 10000 mm. Yep. I'm not saying that, you know, cryptocurrency doesn't have a place and it's a fad, but I, I just can't figure out what it's worth. Yep. No, uh, I agree with you. My friends are always talking about every day I hear, oh, it's Bitcoin is this. Bitcoin went up yeah. this much. Got it. 
Do you own any Bitcoin, Axel? I do not. I do not. You don't. Um, By one of the few your age who doesn't own any, right? No, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's, it could be that I don't fully understand it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, right. Maybe I just try to keep it, keep it, keep my uh, portfolio, same as you said, and, and things that I understand more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, awesome. Awesome. So, all right. So I think this is a good time here to, uh, open it up, um, for everyone who, you know, has any questions or, or any topics that they'd like to discuss. Um, Blake Clifton is presenting something. Bitcoin explained. Thank you, Blake. <laughs> Always helping you out. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so yeah. So great. So yeah. So I think yeah, it might help here if we if everyone switches to gallery view just so we can um, see everyone's lovely faces. So I can see uh, Brooks over there looking good. <laughs> um, Perfect. All right. Yeah. So feel free to uh, either raise your hand or just go ahead and unmute and uh, share your question. Uh, Tommy, thanks for thanks for eating right in front of the camera. An <laughs> <laughs> invitation to the finance cup. That that's that's from Haywood. <laughs> I can get you an invite, Rob, if we can figure out, you know, what you're doing finance and, you know, tell a little story. Hey, Axel, I've got a question. Yes. John, what, what, how do you think um, you, you would have measured up in the Atlantic 10? Um, and, and I guess, Drew, kind of your understanding of what the SOCON is right now, what it was and where we are in the A10, which by and large across most of our sports can be considered a top eight conference in the country. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know the A-10 has VCU, which back when I was playing, they were a very good team. I knew the number one player from VCU, Daniel Anderson, back in the day. I remember we practiced together at NCAAs. Um, he would have been a tough guy for me to beat. Um, I mean, it, it definitely would have been tougher than the Southern Conference for sure. Uh, but, you know, we had, I would say, a, a tougher out-of-conference schedule back then. I mean, University of Virginia used to come to us every year and play us. And they weren't ranked number one in the country back then. But, like, they were still a really good team. I mean, we played UNC every year. Um, we played – I remember Kentucky came to us. Uh, we played South Carolina every year. So we played a lot of – we played Wake Forest. Um, so I remember playing a lot of the ACC teams, um, SEC as well. Uh, you know, we went to the Blue-Gray Invitational. I remember the first time we played against Harvard. Um, so I feel like we really had a decent, you know, out of conference schedule. Uh, maybe maybe it's tougher than it is today, uh, but in conference, it seems like A ten is definitely definitely a step up from the Southern Conference. I mean, how are the Southern Conference teams today? Do you see any of them, Drew? Um, yeah, we do. We still see Furman. Um, okay. Uh, they're one of the. I mean, the conferences have switched so much since in the last five or six years. So like ETSU is back in the conference, but they weren't in the conference when, when we were, or since I've been coaching. Um, College of Charleston, Elon are both out of the league. So is Georgia Southern. Um, so it, it's, it's a mix now than what it was. I think um, the Southern Conference is pretty consistent across the board in terms of level without ETSU. I think they were just top to bottom pretty solid, um, but they didn't have that, I mean, with the first few years I was in the league, we had, I think, upwards of five teams got nationally ranked in top 75. So the Southern Conference was pretty, pretty deep. But I think, you know, with VCU and George Washington at the time, you had two top 50 level teams in the A-10. So I think top-wise, they had a little stronger in the A-10, although the A-10 has a couple teams at the bottom are fairly, fairly weak. Although, you know, LaSalle just dropped their men's tennis program and George Washington just dropped their men's tennis program. So, um yeah, it's interesting. It's just it's kind of evolved over the last, let's say, ten years for sure. Southern Conference and and the A10 even. Yeah. Hmm. All right, we got a we got a question here from Blake. Do you still talk to Johnny Mac? <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't speak to him anymore. We used to what? we used to practice together, um, and then uh, 
when we moved out to the burbs, we kind of we kind of lost touch. I mean, I, I don't love going back to the city. Um, so sorry, Blake. I wish I had some stories for you there, but I don't. <laughs> so you, you played with him when you lived there. Did you live in the city then in New York? Yeah, um, I used to play with him a decent amount. Uh, it was it was awesome. I mean, it, it was fun. You know, it was back back then. I, I mean, how old is, how old was Johnny Mac back then? He was probably late forties. He'd been retired for a while, but we used to have some battles. Um, he had the, the same exact temper on the practice court as he did their real matches. I mean, it, that's just who he is. He, he, he literally he can't control himself. But mm -hmm. well, he, he, he would also question my calls all the time too, which kind of pissed me off. Really. Do you think uh, yeah. that was just to get in your head? I just think it was a little bit of an intimidation thing. He, you know, he wanted me to give him the benefit, the benefit of the doubt on, you know, in every situation. How would, uh, um, cause I know at least in, in Sweden, one of, uh, growing up, one of our top players played with Stefan Edberg, um, just oh. a practice match and got absolutely destroyed. I think this was a, t this was like the number one junior in Sweden and he, he won maybe three games versus a 50 year old. Oh. Edberg. Uh, did That's you amazing. experience, did you experience that same thing? Could you tell that, all right, this guy's really is on another level or used to be. I remember, so if I played him on a clay court, I think I got the best of him on clay, right? Like a slower, uh, red clay court is what we used to play. Um, faster indoor hard. I struggled. Uh, I do remember playing him one time on red clay and like, he must've been feeling amazing that day. I remember he beat me pretty easy in straight sets. And I mean, he was just flawless with his, with his serve, serve volley. I couldn't get anything by him. And that was probably a flash of his former self that I saw, which it wasn't that close. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Are you a, are you a backcourt player or you, you come forward a lot? Yeah. Um, Definitely more of a grinder backcourt player. Yeah, I had a, I had to work for every point. I mean, you know that's why when you get up to the to the next level, it's just unless you have some huge weapon, it's it, it's so hard to really win points easily. Yeah, it's just, every, every point is a battle. Mm -hmm. and John, you hit on a, a couple of key components. Um, you talked about how important culture is. You talked about the power of networking, how you got into your role today. I mean, you got some current players on here who, if they aren't, they will be thinking soon about what they're going to do post-graduation. What advice would you give to this group about, you know, narrowing down kind of the field of interest if for those who want to get in the finance market? I mean, it can be overwhelming at first, you know, how would yeah. you narrow and kind of any thoughts you have or advice for this group? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of people tell you to pursue your passion, but that, 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 that doesn't really mean a whole lot for people who are, you know, about to, about to graduate. So, I mean, I, I pursued my passion and then I stopped when I realized I was probably going to be on food stamps the rest of my life. So at some point, you know, you got you to gotta find, a, find a career. Hopefully you can find something that, that, that you're good at and that gives you fulfillment. Um, you know, Brandon, you, you hit an interesting point earlier. You talked about networking, which I mean, I, I guess I would offer a few, th a, a few things, you know, it's stressful not knowing. I remember when I was playing and I realized that my time was, was coming up, I had to figure out a new career and that was like overwhelming and stressful, just not knowing what's out there. Right. And, and, and the unknown is stressful, but you know, I, I would try not to stress that much because the reality is you don't really know what's out there. And the only way you can sort of see the world, see opportunities is just network as much as you can. Right. And use your Davidson connection, use, use your Davidson tennis connection. I mean, there are so many successful alumni in all different facets of business, even on this call. I mean, you want to go into, you know, banking or private equity, talk, talk, talk to Blake, talk to Travis Pritchard, Pritchard, if you're interested in, you know, real estate, private equity. I mean, you want to go to the restaurant business, talk to Jeff, Tony, Daniel. I mean, there's like every, any industry you can identify. I'm sure you can find a connection either Davidson or, or, or Davidson Tennis where, you know, folks are happy to share their experience and talk to you. There might not be an opportunity, a position available, but the more folks you network with, the more you'll understand what's out there. And, you know, inevitably they'll introduce you to somebody who has an opportunity for you. So I, I would definitely recommend networking uh, as as much as you can, um, 
you know, the other thing, it, it, it's always nice to find a mentor if you can find one, somebody that can kind of guide you along, uh, that you can bounce ideas off of. Um, and then, in, you know, in terms of finding an opportunity, if you're not going into law or, or medicine, you can get involved in business. I'd recommend starting at a large at, at a large company, right, where, where you can see um, a lot of different areas of a of a bank, of an asset management firm, uh, where there's a real training program. And then, you know, once you once you're given that opportunity, the only way you can really differentiate yourself and stand out is just by working really hard. Right. As soon as you get that opportunity, I mean, just just show grit, just just to, sh to show your ability to, to grind, be disciplined. You know, all, all the skills and qualities you, you, you've learned as a student athlete at Davidson. That's where this experience, I think, will will pay dividends down the road. John I, and Axel, you, you benefit. Uh, you know what? Yeah, you think you benefited from this a little bit um, for, for a lot of the alums on here. Um, a, the, the career development department has gotten light years better than what it was than what I'm sure you all experienced and what I experienced when I was here and two we now have Josh King who's the director of athlete career development specific career development career services for scholar athletes so all my current uh players on here um you know I'm sure they know um and have had interaction with Josh already because he hassles them and hounds them and he's done a great job to literally have somebody just focused on 500 scholar athletes and their own, you know, um, uh, you know, career pursuits has really, really been remarkable. Actually, I feel like he just started right when you came in, so maybe you didn't necessarily have that overlap. But I know with your it's insightful that you've worked with Josh pretty, pretty closely. So I think everything that you said is spot on, John. And I think the the framework is much easier now um, when we have somebody just focused on scholar athletes. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this goes to, you know, not just uh, tennis alums, but also just general, you know, Dave, former Davidson students. Um, a lot of my mentors and advisors now for uh, the company that I, that I started, Finsightful, are former Davidson grads. Um, and I've been connected with them through the hub. Um, I've reached out to them just individually. So definitely try to do that as much as possible. Reach out to me at any time. I'm always available. Um, so more than happy, more than happy to help. Same. Well, we are closing in on one hour. So I just, again, want to say thank you to everyone and, and, and a huge shout out to Axel and, and John. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone on this, this, this call will reiterate those thoughts. Um, this is a good segue into just, you know, Axel's point on connecting with alums. We now have a, a, an alumni portal with the Davidson Connect, so I put it in the chat box. And that, that, that has mentorship opportunities for, for the, Davids, the greater Davidson community, but it also has a subgroup for uh, men's tenants, right? So for, for, for current students who are on this or, or for our alums, you can get in there, you can just network with each other and see what each other's up to these, these days, right? So I encourage you to go on there, create a profile if you've not already done so. In terms of follow up from this call, I'm, I'm, John has um, given us permission for anyone who wants to get in contact with him. You can reach out to the Davidson Athletic Fund or, or, or me directly and, and we'll get you some information. But again, we want this to be an ongoing conversation, not just a one and done, right? So please let us know how we can help. Again, thank you to everyone on this call and I hope you have a good rest of the week. Go Cats. Thanks everybody. Good job. See you guys. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks Axel. Thanks John. Good yeah, seeing everybody. See you Friday, Axel. Yeah, see you Friday, Jeff.